For our next reading this evening, why don't we open our Bibles together? We'll all do this together here. We're going to look at Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, first book of the New Testament. We're going to be reading chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 this evening. We've already looked at verses 1 through 4 on the previous Lord's Day. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 5 and continue on to verse 8. Listen now to the word of God. It says this, Matthew 2, 5. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophets, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod, verse 7, summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship Him. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Holy Word. Amen. The reason that we celebrate the incarnation of Christ is not because it is something that's sentimental to us. Now, we need sentimentality. We need that emotional boost from time to time because the world is a dark and dreary place. So there's nothing wrong with sentimentality. I have no particular problem with sentiment, but that's not the reason why we celebrate the incarnation. Neither is it because we need more family time. And again, I have no problem with family time. In fact, I love family time myself. I love my family. I love to be with my family. I can't wait to see my folks in Ohio, perhaps tomorrow if the Lord wills. But that's not the highest reason that we celebrate the incarnation. incarnation. Neither is it because we need rest. And it's true that we need rest. I'm coming up on a vacation pretty quick here, and I I feel it. I feel tired, and I feel like I need some vacation time, and you do too. We all need to take a holiday from time to time to rest and recuperate because we're finite, mortal people. And, and, And moreover, it's not because this is the greatest story ever told, and it is the greatest story that was ever told. The incarnation of Christ, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest story ever told. It's greater than anything Homer ever wrote in the Iliad or the Odyssey. It's greater than any story from mythology or literature. All of those may be fine enough reasons to celebrate the incarnation as we do, but none of them are the highest reason or the greatest motivation for coming tonight. The reason that we celebrate the incarnation of Christ is simply because it's true. It is true. It is absolutely true. And it's true at the deepest sense in which anything can be true. It's epistemologically true. It's, it's metaphysically true. It's historically true. The gospel is savingly true. And so tonight we've come again to study the story of the Magi, which we began last Sunday. And I just want to remind for, for some of you who maybe were there on Sunday, for those of you who are not, we began looking at the story of the Magi, which we're splitting into three pieces last Sunday, tonight, and then tomorrow morning we'll finish up. We began last Sunday looking at the star itself, the star of Bethlehem, and we wondered who it was that saw the star, and we remarked that it was the Magi from a distant place in the east who saw it, and yet Herod, King Herod, with his wicked heart, he couldn't see the star even though it was right above his head. We thought that was somewhat interesting. And we questioned what the star was, and we looked at whether or not it might have been a natural phenomenon or a supernatural phenomenon. I concluded with my own studies that it was an epiphany or an epiphanic celestial vision that God must have given the Magi to summon them to come to Jerusalem and then ultimately to Bethlehem. And then we questioned what were the motives or the responses of the people that saw it. We looked at the scribes who considered the star nothing more than an intellectual curiosity. We looked at Herod, of course, who was troubled by what he saw because or heard at least because, because it threatened his position of power. And then we looked at the Magi, and we're going to come back to them again tomorrow. But for tonight, what I'd like to do is very simple. It's very simple. I just want to look at this prophecy that's given here, especially in verses 5 and 6. This prophecy from Micah, and I want to remark three things about it in the short time that we have together. Now listen, I'm a dad, okay? so I've got, I've got kids, and I was a kid myself, so I know that you've got visions of sugar plum, plums dancing in your heads right now, so I promise I'm going to be brief. But I do want to look at three things tonight. I want to consider, first of all, the supernatural nature of, of this prophecy, and then secondly, the specificity of this prophecy, and then thirdly, the subject of 
the prophecy. So if again, you have your Bible open, let's, let's look particularly at verses 5 and 6. So Herod, when he hears of the arrival of the Magi, again, he's disturbed by this, though he doesn't see the star himself. And he calls the scribes together and he inquires of them. And he wants to know particularly two things. He wants to know, first of all, where the Christ child is to be born according to the ancient scriptures. So he summons the scribes to help him resolve that, that theological issue. And then secondly, he's particularly interested with the timing of the star's arrival because he has a malevolent motive in mind. He wants to wipe out the children that are going to be born under the star sign so that he can retain his power. And so what we see here then is the scribes coming together to solve the problem for Herod. And the scribes, even though I chastised them quite severely in my previous message, I I shamed the scribes for being the experts in religion, and yet, yet though they know the place where the child is to be born, yet they don't go to the place, as the Magi do, to worship. And so here they are, ironically, the most learned of men, and they're able to correctly identify the very place where Messiah is going to be born, and yet they don't apparently go to that place to worship him. And so at least, though, we have to give them the credit that they knew exactly the passage to turn to to identify the place of Messiah's birth. And so they correctly quote here in verse 6, it says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. So they know to turn their, their Old Testament Bibles to Micah chapter 5. And, then I, they, and they know this. Why? Because, because at least they're familiar enough with the nature of biblical prophecy. They understand that the Scriptures have a supernatural origin and power to them. And so, so this prophecy here that Matthew quotes from Micah, it's very interesting because it, because it was written 742 years before Christ ever came. Okay. That's a supernatural prediction. 742 years before Christ came, Micah accurately predicted the very place of his birth. I find that astounding myself. Do you? And that's not the only supernatural prophecy that the Bible gives in relation to Christ. The Old Testament is filled with them. We could go all the way back to Genesis 3, and we could see that God promises that there would be an offspring of Eve who would come to crush the head of Satan. Or we could turn to Deuteronomy 18, which we already looked at tonight, where Moses tells us that there's going to be a greater prophet than even he himself, even though Moses was a great prophet and he had many signs and wonders that attested to God's power working through him, yet Moses says another greater prophet is coming. Or we could look to Isaiah, and we, and we have recently quite a bit. We could look at Isaiah 7.14 where it says that the virgin will, be, will conceive and, and be with child and, and we'll call his name Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. Or we could go to Isaiah 53 and see that this Christ that is to come is going to be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities and that he would rise again to new life. Or we could turn to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi, the last books of the Old Testament, tells us that Christ would come into his temple, right? Which is interesting because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And so we know that the Christ had to have come before 70 AD. And all of this we can put together. Why? Because, because it is a supernatural prophecy that they read. And the Bible is a supernatural book. And what does this supernatural book do? But it points us to supernatural stories. It points us to the working powers and wonders of God who himself is supernatural. And all of these supernatural things point to a supernatural person. And that person is Christ. And therefore, you and I, what we stand in need of is a supernaturally wrought conversion of heart. Matthew, one of his favorite words in the gospel is the word gigraptai. And I don't mean to bog you down with Greek tonight, but it's an interesting word. You can almost hear the word graph or to write in the middle of it. Gigraptai. It's, it's a word that means it is written. And Matthew uses that word nine times in his gospel. When Matthew says gigraptai, it is written, whatever he quotes next is certain to take place. Whatever Matthew says is gigraptai has been destined to take place. It has been decreed of God to take place. It unthwartably will take place. It necessarily must take place. Whenever Matthew says something is gigraptai, it happens. There's only one time it doesn't. 
And that's in Matthew 4 when the devil himself tries to quote that word. It is written and he twists the scriptures and he distorts them. And then Christ refutes him with further get graptized. It is written. And so when Micah tells us 742 years before it happened that the Christ was going to be born in Bethlehem, it was necessarily decreed and absolutely certain to be so. Why? Because the prophecy itself was of supernatural origin. That's number one. Now, secondly, I want to remark here as well that the the prophecy was entirely specific. So notice two, number two here, the specificity of the prophecy prophecy. Look at verse 5. They told him in Bethlehem of Judah, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. So I think it would probably be wise for us then, since Matthew takes the time to quote a portion of it, to go to that prophecy. I'm going to flip back here in my Bible. I'm going to go back to Micah chapter 5. If you want to follow with me, that's fine. Just turn a couple of pages to the left. You don't have to go very far to find Micah. And here's the prophecy that that is quoted here by the scribes, rightly so. And it's clearly a messianic prophecy indicating that its context points towards the arrival of Christ. And it says in Micah 5, 2, let, let's look at the, a bit of the whole thing here. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler, mark that word, in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up when the time, until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, and then the rest of his brother shall return to the people of Israel. He shall stand and shepherd, another key word here, his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be there. Peace. So not only does Micah point towards the city of his birth, but he also lauds this coming Christ with glorious terms. He will lead in the strength of the Lord. He will guide in the majesty of the name of the Lord. He will bring security and greatness to the ends of the earth. He himself, look at verse 5, shall be their peace. And so this, this is somewhat of a marvel to me because not only does, does he generally name the place, but specifically names Bethlehem. Now, the Old Testament, the Old Testament names dozens of places, maybe hundreds. I haven't taken the time to count them, but there are nations, there are regions, there are tribal allotments, there are cities, there are towns, there are villages that are named. In fact, I don't know if you knew this, there's actually two Bethlehems. Did you know that in the Old Testament? There's two. There's one in the north in Zebulun, and there's one in the south, five miles south of Jerusalem. And Micah's prophecy is so specific and particular, it not only names the region and the town, but which Bethlehem? It's Bethlehem of Judea. Now, if you were going to make up a prophecy, you wouldn't make it that specific. You wouldn't know to make it that specific. right? Because if you're going to make a prophecy, if you're going to fake a prediction... What you would do is you'd do something like this. First of all, you'd either speak in such generalities that practically anything could fulfill it. That's how a lot of prognosticators work. They say somebody is going to come do something at some time and some place, and it'll account for some great work. And it'd be so general that you could say, well, anything fulfills this, anything. Or or if you were going to make up a prophecy, if you're going to just invent one out of whole cloth, you would probably guess wrong because if you were to guess the birthplace of Messiah, you would probably guess something like Athens, the city of wisdom, or or Sparta, the city of war. Or you would guess Rome, the city of power. Or at least you'd guess Jerusalem, wouldn't you? The city where the temple was. Or maybe you'd guess the Vatican, the the place of of human worship. Or or maybe maybe you'd guess Paris, the city of of fashion, or New York, the city of commerce, or D.C., the city of politics, you wouldn't guess Bethlehem, Ephrathah of Judea. You just wouldn't. But, but when we look at the Scriptures, one of the things that's so obvious to us is that God is orchestrating all things. And He's bringing it all together so that His divine plan is perfectly fulfilled so that when we turn back to Matthew chapter 2, we realize that absolutely every detail has been brought together by an almighty and sovereign God such that the arrival of the star and the 
the timing of Mary's pregnancy and their travel to Bethlehem and the leading of the star and the precision of the prophecy are all perfectly in tune so that God's will is once again unthwartable. It is gegraptai. It has been written. And so it must be. And so we look at the supernatural nature of the prophecy. We look at the specificity of the prophecy. But, but we would be fools not to consider tonight the subject of the prophecy himself. This is a prophecy not so much about a place, but one who would come to the place. And so turning back with me to Matthew, let's look at, let's look at how Matthew quotes this prophecy. And you... O Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. So there's our first term, rulers, right? For from you shall come a ruler, verse 6, who will shepherd, there's our other key term, my people Israel. So what God promises to give us here in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ is one who will simultaneously be both a ruler on one hand and a shepherd on the other. Now, now just hold those two words in juxtaposition for just a moment. Okay? Because, because they, they connote two different things, do they not? When, when you think of a ruler, this is a term of high exaltation. A ruler is one who is, who is over all else. A ruler is one who is sovereign. A ruler is one who is unchallengeable. The ruler is one who has authority. He is in a position to judge. A ruler is one who has the power to make war and to pardon. Don't forget what Herod's about to do next. That sinister, despicable, wicked act that Herod is about to do is so that he might retain power and maintain himself as a ruler. Yes? So a ruler connotes one who is high and lifted up, whose power is veritably unchallengeable, and yet isn't it interesting that our Christ is also said to be a shepherd, which is a, which is a term of much meekness. It's, a, it's an ordinary profession. It's a term of, of simplicity and humility. You remember perhaps from the Old Testament that in the land of Egypt, the Egyptians, they wouldn't even fellowship with the shepherds because they considered them to be so low and base in their vocation. And so we find this somewhat glorious, don't we? That the Christ who is to come is going to simultaneously have attributes of both exaltation and humility. He is one who is who is both exalted and lofty and glorious, and yet, yet one who is, who is ordinary and meek and gentle and kind. He is the ruler shepherd or the shepherd ruler. And I personally don't think it's too much of a stretch to see here implied in this both the divine nature of Christ and the human nature of Christ. The better theologians say, and this is a sort of a technical term here, they speak of, of the divine nature and the human nature of Christ as being in a hypostatic union. Meaning that Christ is one person who has the divine nature in full and the human nature also in full. It is a great mystery. It is a mystery that is worth contemplating. It is a mystery that is worth savoring. It is a mystery worth rejoicing in and even exalting and praising such that this mystery, this hypostatic union of the divine nature of Christ and the human nature of Christ, all evident here, not only in this prophecy, but don't miss it, especially in the child in the manger. It is worth our praise. It is worth our glory. And so we join with the ancient Chalcedonian Creed, which says, We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with us according to manhood, in all things like unto us, except without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father, according to the Godhead in these latter days for us, 
and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary. Praise God. Amen. And amen.